Hello, everyone. Uh, je suis David Eidelman, vice-principal uh, aux affaires médicales et doyen de la Faculté de médecine et sciences de la santé ici à McGill. Hi, I'm David Eidelman, vice Principal Health Affairs and Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences here at McGill, and it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, our distinguished guests and everyone to this special bicentennial edition of our Holmes Lecture Series, which opens the two-day event, Maud Abbott and the Medical Museum, organized by McGill's Rick Fraser and Anne-Marie Adams. Uh, Dr. Fraser is the director of McGill's Maud Abbott Museum, and Professor Emory Adams is a former chair and a, a current professor in the Department of Social Studies and Medicine. But before we proceed, it's important that I acknowledge that McGill University is located on land that has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. McGill honors, recognizes, and respects these nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which the university stands. Well, our Holmes lectures are named after Andrew Holmes, the first dean of our faculty. They provide a forum for inspiring academic exchange and to give learners a chance to hear from renowned luminaries like today's very distinguished speaker, Sam Alberti, director of collections at the National Museum of Scotland, who will be formally introduced in a moment. It's a great honor to have you with us. As you may know, we are in the midst of celebrating our bicentennial, and we've used this as an occasion to reflect on our past as well as on our future. We're proud of our history of teaching and of excellence in teaching and research, and we also have to acknowledge that over the past 200 years, not everyone has been given the same opportunities to shine, and in fact, many voices were silenced. And that's why we've been making a conscious effort to give back space to voices that must be heard. One way we are doing this uh, today is by celebrating uh, a, a true pioneer, um, a Gill pathology lecturer and a, a curator, Maud Abbott, whose genius now universally acknowledged was not officially recognized during her lifetime for no other reason than she was a woman. Scholars like Rick and Anne-Marie have been working hard to rectify that tonight. We are in for a fascinating discussion of one of Abbott's greatest legacies, the development of the field of medical museology with Dr. Alberti's lecture. Before I go, I'd like to thank Rick and Anne-Marie for organizing this wonderful event and thank all of you for attending. I also want to thank and acknowledge the Rose Weiselberg Foundation for their generous support that makes uh, this, these lectures possible. Au nom de la Faculté de médecine et sciences de la santé de McGill, je vous souhaite à tous une excellente conférence. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the lecture. Over to you, Rick. As director of the Maud Abbott Medical Museum, which this year is celebrating its 10th anniversary, it gives me particular pleasure to introduce Dr. Sam Alberti, Director of Collections of the National Museums of Scotland and Honorary Professor in Heritage Studies at the University of Stirling, who will speak to us today about the past, present and future of museums and medical knowledge. Dr. Alberti is eminently qualified to speak on this subject, having chaired and worked with many groups concerned with medical museology and served as Director of Museums and Archives at the Royal College of Surgeons of England, with responsibility for the famous Hunterian Museum and the Wellcome Museum of Anatomy and Pathology, and as Keeper of Science and Technology for the National Museums of Scotland. Dr. Alberti's research has focused on the history of collections, in particular the trajectories and meanings of scientific, medical, and natural objects in Britain since 1800. He's curated many exhibits on related topics of which I will mention only two as examples of what he has done. War, Art and Surgery at the Royal College of Surgeons in London. And secondly, Anatomy, a Matter of Death and Life at the National Museum of Scotland. He's also written extensively on the subject of medical museology, including many journal articles and books with titles such as Morbid Curiosities, Medical Museums in 19th Century Britain. His current research interest, interests include Cold War museology and the role of museums in the climate emergency. Dr. Alberti is widely known and respected as a scholar in the field and as a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland and the Royal Scottish Society of Arts. We are grateful that he is accepted to speak to us this evening as part of our celebrations of the 200th anniversary of McGill University and the 10th anniversary of the Maud Abbott Medical Museum. 
I'd like to ask you all to keep your cameras on for the duration of the talk, which will give at least an impression that we are all present in person. And Dr. Alberti will be available after his talk to answer questions, which I invite you to ask at any time via the chat box. And with this as introduction, I will now give the virtual microphone to Dr. Alberti. Welcome. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Fraser. I hope you can hear me. If somebody gives me a thumbs up, that's great. So uh, Dean Adelman, Dr. Fraser, Professor Adams, uh, bonsoir, merci pour l'invitation. C'est très généreux et je suis honoré. Malheureusement, j'ai utilisé maintenant tous mes mots français. Donc, I shall speak for the rest of the evening in English, which I think everybody will be much relieved. I'm delighted and honored, as I say, to deliver the Andrew F. Holmes VP, Dean of Medicine and Health Science Distinction Lecture um, uh, here, <laughs> here in McGill and here in Edinburgh. Um, I'm particularly pleased because as you know, we, we've heard Andrew Holmes, co-founder and first Dean, as I understand it, his most famous artifact is in the collection, is the Holmes Heart, a specimen procured at autopsy in 1822 and presented, as I understand it, in Edinburgh. And I've been looking forward to hearing more about this from Professor Parton's lecture tomorrow. But that Edinburgh to Holmes to Abbott connection is very nice. So um, just a, a, a couple of disclaimers. Um, my current role, I'm very uh, pleased to work with National Museum Scotland. I lead a team, lead and support a team of 130 curators and other collections professionals in art, science, nature, um, culture and history across four museums and a collection centre. And our job is to activate a 12 million strong collection. And as we've heard from the generous in introduction, my own practice currently focuses on climate change in museums and the now startlingly relevant Cold War. But once upon a time, I was a medical curator. And tonight, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to return to my old stomping grounds and reflect and review the use of medical knowledge in museums. Now, in what follows, you'll notice a distinct bias towards the UK and an even more distinct bias towards museums in which I've worked. I'll be thinking about national museums and museums in higher education institutions, which I hope will be particularly relevant um, to those listening uh, with a particular interest in the Maud Abbott Medical Museum. And I'll be focusing where I can on Edinburgh and Glasgow as a, as a new Scot. We'll be talking about two sorts of collections, two different distinct species of medical collection, if you will, the wet or organic medical collection of pathology and anatomy, or the dry, you might say, inorganic collection of surgical and medical instruments and uh, uh, pharmaceutical pots and the like. But I'll be thinking about these things together. And some of the key messages I hope that will come across are that medical museums tend in initially at least, to be set up to celebrate their founders, who were usually great white men, capital G. The medical museums populated by the dead are actually about the living. And the medical museums use knowledge, museums use medical knowledge for good. And I'll be using a recent generation of redeveloped medical museums, of which the Maud Abbott is, is at the forefront, as an example of how this is applied, and I'll take a particular case study in using medical knowledge in museums to enhance understandings of difference and disability, to be my case study. So having heard those key messages, if you're, you're in your early evening, if you want to kick back and have a relax, you don't really need to listen to the rest of it. We can come back to the exciting bits when your questions start flooding in. A couple of quick riders. Firstly, about the images, I haven't credited the images on my slides. They're either in the public domain or it's obvious where they're from, or I'll credit them verbally. But please do contact me if you find out otherwise. And also just an apology, it's uh, 10 p.m. here. I've forsaken my usual dram for water, but just forgive me if I start fading halfway through. So. I'll now attempt at least to share my screen. Great. So 
you've heard all about the um, uh, me and the topic, and uh, we'll come back actually to, to that image later, because I want to start, where else, with Maud Abbott. Now, I've been a fan of Maud, and I feel after 20 years that I can, you know, use, use the first, we're on first name terms, I think. Um, and you might think this is a rather nerdy enthusiasm to have, but I have a feeling that tonight of all nights, I'm among friends. For me, Dr. Abbott was a legend for co-founding the International Association of Medical Museums, and also for setting up the Canadian Medical War Museum that I had so much fun discussing with uh, Dr. Wright and Professor Lyons and, and Dr. Fraser. Now, actually this evening, I'm not gonna talk a great deal about Maud, but her presence will be there behind us. And I, as I like to remember her from this rather fine postage stamp. But importantly for what I will be talking about, she used her collection to understand the human heart in particular, and thereby to, for clinical benefit. She used medical knowledge in the museum to benefit humankind. In her case, via her famous atlas, which Ingenium uh, calls a life-saving Canadian innovation, and quite right too, I think. But let's step back. Let's go back into the deeper history. I'll start the story in um, the middle of the 18th century when anatomical collections in their current modern form began to emerge. And these anatomical and, patholog anatomical and pathological collections have their history in medical training. Now amongst these collections, the role of William and John Hunter in this development, the two brothers um, from Scotland who made their careers and their renown in London, even setting aside partiality of my, my, my former workplace, you can't overestimate the role of William Hunter and John Hunter in setting up, uh, certainly in the UK, um, medical museums um, as they came down to us today. Both of them gathered sizable and diverse collections, not only to teach anatomy, but to emphasize their own culture and refinement. And we'll see this over again. Posthumously, the museums were respectively transferred to the University of Glasgow and the organization that became the Royal College of Surgeons of England. Now, if we were all in a room together, which would have been nice, and maybe next time, um, I would at this point ask the learned members of the audience to call out the, um, uh, the names of the medical museums. I have three or four slides throughout the lecture where there's a quad of medical museums and it's uh, uh, to test you on your uh, museological and architectural knowledge. Now, perhaps I won't do that this evening, but if you see a slide with four medical museums on, I'll ask you just a little tally of the ones that you recognize. So we'll have a little game of spot the museum and at the end, perhaps um, you can volunteer it. If anyone got 100%, um, perhaps there'll be a prize from, uh, from the, the Maud Abbott Medical Museum, who knows. So here we have um, a, a representation of the buildings of a generation of institutional museums that came from these private museums in the 18th century and were absorbed into larger institutions, into colleges, hospitals, proprietary medical schools and royal colleges of surgeons, big hint right there. And they all stocked sizable teaching collections. In short, if you were uh, gonna teach anatomy or pathology or any kind of medicine, you needed a large collection. And so they had large collections in top left, University of Glasgow, that's the original Hunterian Museum based on William Hunter's collection. Bottom right, the Royal College of Surgeons of England based on John Hunter's collection. And then anything um, Glasgow and London can do, clearly Edinburgh bottom left can do better. That's what is now the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh and top right, the Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland. So a Royal Museum, a Royal College rather, needed a museum and as we can see from this, needed a healthy set of pillars out front as well. But medical museums were not limited to the elite and medical knowledge was displayed in all manner of different places, including um, uh, a whole swathe of uh, private anatomy museums and commercial anatomy shows. 
So medical knowledge was transmitted in these less orthodox collections by Joseph Kahn and, and his ilk. And they purported to offer the visitor from any walk of life the chance to know thyself, an attempt to democratize anatomical knowledge and make a bit of cash in the meantime. These museums continue to gather steam, to continue to gather um, specimens, continue to be used for research and especially for teaching. And here's another uh, chance to spot the museum. It's getting a little bit harder now, certainly for those of you who may be uh, UK based. So there's been a great deal of historical attention to the 18th century and the founding of these 19th century museums, but actually their high watermark was in the mid decades, the 20s, 30s, um, uh, through to the 50s in, the, um, in the, the 20th century. So here we have top left, the vast collection of Bartholomew's at Bart's uh, Hospital in London. Top right, shown here in 1890, then the Army Medical Museum, now the US uh, National Museum of Health and Medicine. Uh, bottom left, the Wellcome Museum of Medical Science. Um, we'll come back to Henry Wellcome in a little while. And top right, again, we'll come back to this, is the Charité in, um, in Berlin. And these are some of the largest and most prestigious medical collections at the time in this, in their high water mark, as I say, in the early to mid 20th centuries. So now they're numbering in the tens of thousands of specimens. And you'll recognize, of course, that this scale is across the museological, across cultures of display. So this is the era of World's Fairs when they get really big. And we'll hear about Maud Abbott's contribution to the 1933 Chicago uh, World Fair, I believe, from Professor Adams tomorrow. But in these museums, these were three-dimensional atlases of disease. These were, this was visual and material knowledge. A little closer to home, and this is one of my favorite images of the uh, University of Edinburgh uh, Anatomy Museum with the um, early 20th century, early to mid 20th century students there um, studying, studying carefully. Um, this is part of what had been a massive museum in the center of the grand medical faculty at TV at Place. And this space is about 300 yards from my office. At the moment, this time of night, I'm at home, of course. Anatomy was at the heart of this giant three-story museum, but it had a kind of corona of other collections all around it, each uh, collected to materialize distinct specialist knowledges. There was a museum for medical jurisprudence, that is to say forensic medicine, for surgery, for materia medica, for physiology, gynecology, otolaryngology, dermatology, military surgery, and of course, pathology. They continued to be really important teaching resources, as you can see here, through the mid 20th century. But by this time, they began to, um, you know, uh, curators were also developing um, a different sort of medical museum, transmitting a different sort of medical knowledge. From the earlier 20th century, as an expansion of a practice that had been developing in those museums um, for some time, but at this point started really to expand, we see material culture of uh, medical practice. We see instruments and the, the hard um, uh, uh, artifacts and so on, gathered not so much for transmitting medical knowledge, but rather for use as heritage, as celebration of uh, medical um, men, mostly men, and medical achievements. So we see here on the left, um, Howard Dittrick, uh, a renowned collector whose collection is now the heart of the Dittrick Medical History Center at Case Western Reserve University in Ohio, which had its roots in this period. On the right, you can see the uh, um, displays that were there until recently at the Royal College of Surgeons of England, which had um, collections of instruments that effectively were put together as a shrine to Joseph Lister. Similarly, the Danish Medical Association's 50th anniversary conference in 1907 had an exhibition of 
uh, art and artifacts and instruments that became the root of what is now the Medical Museum at the University of Copenhagen. But the sort of heritage that's been celebrated here, the sort of knowledge that's been communicated is about celebrating pioneers of medicine. This is biographical, hagiographical knowledge displayed in medical museums and very much aimed at a medical audience, certainly originally. And one can't talk about collecting medical material culture in this period without talking about this man, since we're talking about great white men. This is a Henry Solomon Welcome here, top right, uh, he is in the early 20th century, who gathered what was probably the most expansive private collection in the world of any sort, let alone medical, so that when it was dispersed in the decades following his death, some of the disposals, the deaccessions, we might politely say, it's the only act of deaccessioning I'm aware of as a curator where the deaccessioning uh, unit was by the ton. He had gathered this vast, vast collection. And even though a small part of it was medical, um, even then when they dispersed and transferred um, uh, the medical instrument a fraction of this collection to the Science Museum in the 1970s, it numbered 114,000 objects, thus in a stroke doubling the size of the collection of the Science Museum in London. And still to this day, it's technically on loan, uh, which if you're a, any museum registrars in the audience, you'll be having um, uh, you know, feeling faint at this point. So it's a very nerdy museum professional joke right there. So they opened, the Science Museum opened the original welcome galleries about the history of medicine in 1981. You can see at the bottom right there. And then um, 40 years later, um, just recently in November 2017, um, they reopened their new uh, welcome galleries based on those collections and others um, to great fanfare and great acclaim, justifiably, I think, the wonderful galleries opened in 2019 and that's at the, the Science Museum in London. Now these, by this point, these displays, these huge galleries are, are but the latest in a new generation of medical museum redisplays. Now welcome through the foundation, what is now Welcome Trust, through his collection, through uh, um, uh, the public front of his collection as opposed to the Science Museum called Welcome Collection, had a big part in this, um, but they weren't alone. So from the turn of the millennium, we get a big quantitative and qualitative change in the type of displays and the type of audiences and the type of knowledge being transmitted, being engaged with in these museums. And these are now what my colleagues, uh, Ken Arnold and Simon Chaplin have dubbed post-medical museums. So we must remember that few of them are transmitting, um, strictly speaking, purely medical knowledge anymore, but rather that's mixed in with cultural history. These are cultural history institutions. So although a lot of the medical museums um, uh, are operational today are used for biomedical research, but they're also used just as much, if not more, as by historians, as by uh, medical practitioners, as you know from the excellent work in the last decade at the Maud Abbott. And an interesting part of this cultural approach um, is bringing um, case histories, bringing individual knowledge and the individual biographical knowledge in, into displays. So here's another one of the Spot the Museum slides. And a great example of using individual case studies to illustrate cultural history can be found in the bottom left slide here, which is what the one of the galleries in how the Charité Medical Museum um, now looks in Berlin, where they use museum objects to show the original case studies of, of patients identified by their, by their first names only so that their privacy is protected. And that's based in a 1910 ward of the original medical clinic at the Charité where Visitors can encounter 10 beds revealing the stories of people with different medical conditions between 1727 and 2006. The other museums, by the way, um, you'll have guessed as Welcome Collection as opposed to the Science Museum, um, top left, 
Um, bottom right is the Muta Museum at the uh, College of Physicians in Philadelphia, and top right is the Royal College of Surgeons of England, the um, Ontario Museum, as it was um, until uh, a couple of years ago, where they closed for, for refurbishment. A little bit closer to home, William Hunter's collection at the University of Glasgow became core to what is now a large and vibrant multidisciplinary university museum. Now, technically, the anatomy, pathology and zoology elements remain in the custody of their respective university departments, where for two centuries they've been used as uh, major teaching resources. But the anatomy department now opens its galleries and museums to students and researchers and have installed a new store for the preparations and the models that are not on display. Their historic collections, meanwhile, their historic medical collections are used to great effect in the central um, uh, portion of the of the Ontario Museum and were used extensively in the tercentenary of, um, of William Hunter. You'll remember the slide of the bottom of the Teviot building where the University of Edinburgh anatomy collection was displayed. It now occupies only the top floor of that building, um, but is still going strong. It's rather, rather smaller um, and it's only open to the public uh, once a month, but it's nonetheless very lively and it's part of a cluster of multidisciplinary collections within the university. And that is to say beyond the disciplines that I mentioned when we were last looking at the University of Edinburgh. There's an art gallery, a musical instrument collection, natural science teaching resources and research collections and so on, which is what their, um, their head Jackie McBeath calls an all collection approach. So they've been bringing these different elements of the university um, together very effectively and centralizing a lot of the functions. A lot of them will be used in 2032 when the University of Edinburgh will be 450 years old. And it's one of the younger ones of the old universities in, um, in, in Scotland. The anatomy collection in the meantime, shown here, uh, will be at the center of the medical schools. Medical school is merely 300 years old and the anatomy collection will be used a great deal there. But this remains under the purview of the chair of anatomy and which uh, in the last decade or so, it's benefited from the energy and efforts and the guidance of, of Tom Gillingwater. Um, there's dedicated heritage staff now, and there's been a burst of activity of, um, thanks to Tom's approach of what he calls bringing anatomy out of a dark corner. There's anatomy teaching with the collection, there's multidisciplinary research, and there's a great deal of arts and creative practice. And it was actually uh, a little project with this collection that first brought me up to Edinburgh. So I've, I've, it's, a, a, it's a warm place in my heart for it. Also, of course, because the university and the anatomy collection work very closely with the Royal Colleges in Edinburgh, with the surgeons, with the physicians, and of course, with my own institution, National Museum Scotland. Now, this is quite neat. It's quite satisfying because we share a pedigree. Our natural science collections are based on those of the university established in 1816, and material has gone back and forth in the two centuries ever since. The main university building that used to house the collections is immediately next door, and there's a bridge of size going between the museum and the university, although it has been closed off for some decades, arguably because of a prank by some university students, but the university blames the curators. What can you do? But I'm delighted to report that this year, a long running, much delayed, much pandemic delayed collaboration uh, will finally bear its macabre fruit. And we'll be working together, the University, the Royal Colleges and ourselves on an exhibition, as uh, uh, Dr. Fraser uh, mentioned, Anatomy, a Matter of Death and Life. Um, I should say that I'm no longer curating this exhibition. It's something that I had to, they had to kind of take from my hands when I took my, my new role, but we have two excellent curators, Dr. Tacey Phillipson and Sophie Coggins, who are taking this um, uh, exhibition forward. And it'll be our major summer exhibition here in Edinburgh. So do come and see it if you have the opportunity to visit and it will run through October. Now the exhibition aims to retell the history of anatomy um, education, especially um, about cadaver provision 
from Leonardo here, um, Leonardo's anatomical sketches here on your left, you can see courtesy of the Royal Collection, um, and through Albinus there on the right from the Royal College of Physicians, through to the Westport Murders by uh, William Burke and William Hare, and beyond. We're looking at um, the roots, uh, heterodox and orthodox, whereby cadavers came to be used and why they were used in anatomical education, not to forgive some of the um, practices and the grave robbing and the murders of William Burke and William Hare, but rather to understand in the relation to social context, especially, and thinking a lot about the poverty um, of the um, individuals whose bodies were, were dissected. But we'll be bringing the story right up to date to voluntary body donation as it's practiced now in Scotland. And we'll seek to encourage visitors to reflect on their own approach to their body. And that is, we'll be using medical collections once again to encourage beneficial behaviors and to encourage greater understanding of social context. So this is one of a range of ways that this new generation of post-medical museums, if you like, are being used to advocate for different elements of public benefit. And for the rest of my time, the next 10 or 15 minutes or so, I'd like to focus on one particular way that medical museums have been used to, um, for, to advocate for public benefit, for the good, and that's to look at how medical museums are used to appreciate and understand difference and disability. So, right from the very start, pathological collections have included material evidence of difference and disability. Here, for example, is a curved spine from the body of a patient dissected by John Hunter. We don't know who it was or how John Hunter came by their body, but like many of the specimens in the museum, it shows a condition that still affects patients today. Historian Ruth Richardson has written eloquently and movingly about the specimen, as she herself lives with a related condition, scoliosis. But I'd like to reflect on how and um, where we've breathed life into a material like this, how we can use them to connect with people today. And to do that, I'll explore some examples from UK museums in the last couple of decades. Now, a lot of the work I'll be talking about, it stems from a lively group um, uh, in the Museum Studies Department at the University of Leicester, um, uh, you know, spearheaded by Richard Sundell and Jocelyn Dodd. They worked, for example, with the Royal College of Physicians in London on a project, Rethinking Disability Representation, looking at fine art and portraiture originally, which gave rise to a, a fascinating output, Reframing Disability, back in 2011. As part of this project, they re-examined uh, 17th through 19th century portraiture, studying how disability had been represented over time and using these to provoke uh, dialogue with contemporary artists and activists, many of whom live with disabilities. And this is a recurring theme throughout the projects I'll be talking about. They displayed historic collections, such as uh, this portrait of Thomas Inglefield, um, the artist, uh, born in 1769, this portrait from 1804 and juxtaposing with uh, uh, portraiture, photographic portraiture of the focus group people they worked with, including here, Karen Sutherland, who's from Edinburgh, which is why I like picking this one, a uh, photograph here by Lynn Weddle from 2011. Now there's an important issue here, an important uh, opportunity here that um, the Leicester team and the curators they worked with used the project to engage with medical versus social models of disability using collections from medical museums. That is to say whether disability is considered an individual problem to be fixed with medical help, or whether society should rather adapt to um, around um, disability and difference. And this theme continued through later projects. So this is the, one of the outputs of a project called Stories of a Different Kind, with which the Leicester colleagues picked up again as a pilot study to see what happened if you started 
commissioning new art based on collections beyond portraiture. They moved out to the wider medical museum um, community. In the resulting artwork from this pilot project, uh, performance artist Matt Fraser, shown here, talked about and in fact rapped about the lived experience of many of the items in the Royal College of Surgeons of England collections. So he and I didn't have a great deal of common at the start. He'd just come fresh from the um, opening of the Olympics and Paralympics in London, where he had played the drums, he's a very accomplished drummer, with the band Coldplay. Um, I haven't performed with so many international uh, rock audiences, um, but we did get on very well and found a similar approach to looking at the history of medical museums. And it was a great project to work on. The Leicester folk and uh, myself and the other medical curators then moved more wide, uh, more widely um, to um, uh, set up a wider program of interventions uh, under the banner exceptional, or except, pardon me, as you can see here, exceptional and extraordinary and really bodies and minds in the medical museum. We branched out, you know, to further medical museums from physical disability to emotional and medical disability exploring how disabled people have been uh, the exceptions that prove the rule pre presented in reductive and dehumanizing ways underpinning negative ideas about what and who is different, uh, who is deemed different, deviant and problematic. We aimed, and I think in some extent succeeded to stimulate public and professional debate about uh, contested social and biomedical issues about the way disabled people and disability are thought about, responded to and treated. It created four really emotionally impactful uh, artworks, including dance and comedy, um, which was uh, uh, relatively unusual at that time for medical museums, but worked rather well. And as ever funded here by, by the Wellcome Trust. Also at this time, at the Royal College of Surgeons of England, we were undertaking um, a rather more, um, shall I say, somber um, approach um, with the, um, coinciding with the centenary commemorations of the First World War. And we worked on a project uh, with um, artist um, Julia Midgley, um, contrasting her work with recovering service personnel who'd been injured in Afghanistan, with the stunning pastel portraits of service personnel with facial injuries, pastels um, you may know, um, painted by the renowned artist surgeon Henry Tonks. So on the right here is Professor Walter Ashworth of the 18th West Yorkshire Regiment, who was injured in the Battle of the Somme. Um, his uh, wounds were then treated over multiple operations by the uh, renowned um, reconstructive surgeon Harold Gillies. Ashworth was said to be satisfied with the final operation. Gillies noted he was left with a whimsical, one-sided expression, which was not entirely unpleasant. And as shown, we see here in the pastel portrait by, by Henry Tunks. We juxtapose this, as I say, with the work of report, reportage artist Julian Midgley, who here had sketched um, service, um, serviceman Andy Reid, um, who had um, suffered uh, life-changing injuries caused by an improvised explosive device in 2009. And this picture was from 2012 after he left the army. Um, and I quote him, if I may, in this picture, I was just getting up to walk out of the room. I was about to attach the other prosthetic as there's no point in wearing one leg. I don't wear the electronic arm very often because it's heavy. Julia's picture looks to me a bit unfinished, and without my leg, I look a bit unfinished too. I think the more people know about rehabilitation, the better. Soldiers' deaths are in the news, but not what happens to those of us recovering from injuries. So what we tried to do with this project, part of the First World War commemorations, was to promote, promote understanding of, and tolerance of disability and disfigurement, and to understand the experience from both past and present. We've also been working around difference in disability at National Museum Scotland. So this was part of the redisplay of our galleries of science, um, technology and medicine. These put together by biomedical curator, 
and our senior curator, Sophie Goggins. She talked a great deal to asthma patients. She talked about their connections with technology. Uh, she put out an advert in Asthma UK and uh, in the gallery are films of, of two asthma patients talking about their experience and on display here, Scott McLeod, who's a rugby player who lives with asthma. In the collection, we are also um, have an extraordinary collection of um, prosthetic arms. So here at the top, we see the early prototype of the Simpson Series 2 prosthetic arm designed by David Simpson in Edinburgh in the late 1960s. And below we see the Ed so-called Edinburgh modular arm system developed by David Gow and his team and used by Hotelier Campbell Aird. So we at NMS, at National Museum of Scotland, we try to use these artifacts to address the thorny relationship between disability and technology. So we've got this so-called EMAS on the bottom, um, known as the world's first bionic arm, and also material from the engineers and the medics who um, dis uh, displayed them. Now, Campbell Aird, who lost his arm to cancer, was pleased to use the first Edinburgh arm. He said, it will enable me to do simple things like tie my own shoelaces. But not all users have such positive experiences. Alan and Devon are among the survivors of those born around 1960 with life impacting birth defects after their mothers were prescribed thalidomide during pregnancy. As young children, they were assigned innovative prosthetic limbs, but ultimately neither of them opted to use them. Sophie interviewed them during the preparation and they feature in the, in the gallery at National Museum Scotland. But Yvonne told curators, approaching my teenage years, the arms made me look normal, but they were heavy and cumbersome for my small body frame. I needed help with dressing when wearing them, but without them, I could manage independently. So this testimony of non-use enmeshed in the technologies in question is a powerful but important balance to accounts of superhuman valor and groundbreaking first that one often sees in um, uh, communication around um, people who live with um, these sorts of differences. We aim at National Museum of Scotland to balance between, as I mentioned in earlier projects, the medical model of disability, that those are problems to be fixed with a social approach, that disability is part of the rich fabric of human life and society should change. We try in our interpretation to stimulate awareness and dialogue in our visitors. By taking an advocacy approach, we're able to collaborate effectively, not only with users, but also with the surgeons and prosthetists who might have been alienated by a much more activist stance. So we take an advocate stance rather than activist stance. And I'd be happy to come back to that in questions if that's of interest. And uh, Mr. Chair, if I've got time for one final um, uh, uh, case study example before, before concluding. Um, the third final conclusion come, uh, excuse me, it is now getting late. The final example comes from uh, the Smithsonian um, in, uh, in DC, where Smithsonian curator Catherine Ott, Catherine Ott has been for many years collecting, exhibiting, and using digital engagement to campaign against not only racism, but also ableism. Ableism, which she terms as the belief that people with disabilities are inferior to the able-bodied. As part of one of the many advocacy projects she's been involved with over her career, she collected the bicycle that belonged to Junius Wilson, a deaf African-American man who was confined to a psychiatric facility in North Carolina for 70 years, 7-0. In his youth, Wilson communicated via a form of sign language taught only to African-Americans, which no one else understood in the legal trial he endured after he was wrongfully arrested. Despite having no psychiatric condition, he was incarcerated in what was known as the State Hospital for the Negro Insane, close quote, and sterilized. His bicycle's presence in the National Collection speaks of the limited freedom he gained later in life after he was released. This mundane artifact represents Wilson's agency. Its presence in the display at Smithsonian is a subtle element of an ongoing campaign for disability rights. These are medical, medical knowledge, medical and cultural knowledge used in museums to promote public benefit for the good.
So it feels fitting to be talking about uh, using uh, medical elections for good uh, as a preface to the wonderful uh, symposium tomorrow where we'll be talking about Maud Abbott, who was, after all, a tireless pioneer. She wanted medical museums to generate medical knowledge, educational and clinical benefit. I've observed today some of the ways that curators and their collaborators are using different sorts of knowledge, not only for education and anatomy, but also for social and cultural benefit. What then of the future? And here is what I've labeled in my notes, my shameless plug slide. On the left, um, a book from 2011, um, a rather historical, um, uh, worthy historical tome. On the right, available to pre-order in your local bookshop, um, is uh, 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 my own personal take on museums of science, technology, and medicine, which will be available, I hope, on August the 15th. Disability, as I talk about in the book on your right, is just one example of how collections can be activated for public benefit. And much of this, as we talked about, is un about unpacking the medical model of disability and juxtaposing that with a social model, about bridging that gap, hopefully, about balancing narratives of valorization and victimization in the representation of difference and disability in museums and other media. This, I argue, is using museums in a good way as a contact zone between medical and social knowledges. And this is museums and their staff as advocates. There are, of course, other areas of equality and understanding that museums can be used for. The history of women in medicine, for example, um, and you can find, of course, much of this in the excellent work um, in and around the Maud Abbott Medical Museum. There's also very good challenging work on race and ethnicity taking place elsewhere in the museum sector. And I talk about in the book on the right and what I'm working on with my colleagues at National Museum Scotland at the moment is how to use museum collections to advocate behavioural change um, to combat the climate emergency. And there's also very interesting work in museums of science, technology and medicine of how to combat misinformation. We know, for example, that one can't simply challenge uh, misinformation and disinformation about climate change and about uh, vaccination and so on. One can't simply challenge with more and more facts, but rather to uh, provide evidence and information and material evidence for people to make up their own minds. But today, this evening, what I hope to have done is to give you a glimpse, a little tour of medical museums, past and present, and to give you a glimpse of the ways that I perceive medical knowledge has been used in them, deployed in them for public benefit, for good, over the past, what do we do, two and a half centuries. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Alberti, Sam. Um, I'm Anne Marie Adams, an architectural historian in the Department of Social Studies of Medicine here at McGill. And on behalf of everyone in the audience and the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences at McGill, I'd like to thank you for your splendid lecture. What an amazing way to celebrate Andrew Holmes. I hope I got the math right here. 225th birthday today. He was born in 1797. Um, of course, I especially appreciated your, um, your attention to the relationship of architecture, the architecture of the museum and the collection. And uh, I think we're all inspired by your new work on difference and disability. I'm not sure if you would remember, but when we met in 2014 at the Hunterian at a conference, um, and we were just talking casually about Maud Abbott between some papers, you referred to her um, as the mother superior of medical museum curators. <laughs> and that has always stuck with me and it has inspired a lot of uh, my own work on Maud Abbott. So I, I wanted to say that publicly. And of course, if you were here in person, we would have a chance to take you for a nice dinner uh, and, and, and we would give you a small gift, which actually I'd like to bring to you in Edinburgh next fall when I'll be there. 
but alas on Zoom, we are limited to applause and deep thanks. Um, so thank you very, very much. We have a few questions for you that were submitted as, uh, as our participants registered, which will be read by uh, my colleague, uh, Rick Fraser. And I think, I'm not sure how much time we have, we'll be ending at 10 after seven, um, but uh, we'll also be monitoring the chat. So over to you, Rick, if you've got good Wi-Fi. So first question. Uh, I'll give you perhaps some of the easy ones first. How, how can we encourage medical and allied health students to learn medical history and to visit medical museums? Well, um, my own experience is that once we get them into the museum, they're kind of hooked. So the um, uh, the knack is is getting them in now. Now I'm I hope I hope there are medical students in the audience, and um, I uh, hope I will not offend anyone by saying offering um, social occasions to get them in the museum if it's appropriate, and you know if uh, um, uh, you can is a is a very good way. Um, I was reflecting on um, I was talking to a young tattoo artist last night, as one does. Um, and I was reflecting on an event we held um, many years ago on Valentine's Day when our learning officer, when I was then working at the Ontario Museum, our learning officer convinced me it was a good idea that we'd have a Valentine's Day event um, advertised as, uh, and any pathological preparators will shudder, advertised as pickling a human heart. Now, of course, she wasn't getting to pickle a human heart. She was, it was um, plasticine, putty, you know, in glasses and so on. But she, 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 you know, put this out, and it was getting a younger, perhaps funkier audience into the into the museum. Now, this turned out very interestingly. So I came out onto the steps that evening. I was just working the event to support her, and um, uh, I spotted a queue going around the block. So I raised my eyebrows at her that we'd had so many. And it apparently had been picked up by Time Out, which was the London listings magazine. So I thought, well, this is rather good. We'll just need a bit of crowd management. Then to my right, I realized that the entire um, council of the Royal College of Surgeons and the court of the worshipful company of barbers were processing to their annual joint dinner. I hadn't quite checked the use of the building that evening. And so they're, you know, esteemed knights of the realm, knights and dames of the realm, clad in ermine, as I remember it. And these rather funkier students and, and goths and emos with green hair and tattoos coming up different sides of the stairs and going through the same entrance. Uh, it was a moment when my heart was in my mouth. I was about to come pickle it later. Um, and I saw my career flash before my eyes. But fortunately, the, the great and the good um, looked at the funkily clad young people and students and thought they were rather marvelous. And the young people looked at these these folk in their in their robes and their their processing and thought they were rather marvelous, um, and they coexisted quite happily that evening. Now, I'm not suggesting that you need to get in the listings of your local magazine or have queues going around the block, but it was that slight, just that one step of imagination by our learning officer that got them in that evening. Thank you. Another question uh, that came uh, from uh, pre-registration or during registration, which I think is uh, relevant for your research. What can we learn from the history of medicine in helping to understand the urgent need for government action on addressing our anthropogenic climate crisis? Mm. Uh, that's an extremely well-informed um, question and actually I will confess that I haven't joined up those two bits of my brain before and thought about medical museums and the climate crisis together. So I would welcome whoever put that excellent question in, I'd welcome your suggestions about that. I think that's a great question that I'm embarrassed to say I'm unable to answer. Here, there's another one. This is difficult, I think but uh, maybe you can give us some words of wisdom. 
how should museums address the exploitation of certain communities in the acquisition of medical knowledge? That's a question that runs across um, medical collections, anthropological collections, historical collections. Um, and it's part of a broader challenge across these sorts of museums. Um, so these anthropological, anatomical, pathological, historical, archaeological collections in certainly in Europe and North America tend to have been gathered. And I was talking about this, this, this high watermark period between the 1880s and the 1920s and 30s, which of course is not only the high watermark of museums, but the high watermark of, of empire and colonialism. So there's, um, there's there are considerable efforts um, across the sector to, to do what has been the shorthand, rather clumsy shorthand, is to decolonize collections. I'm not sure that's entirely possible. I think it's worthy in trying, but what is important is to um, be open and frank about how these collections came to be in museums and then use them to understand the encounters between the cultures that gave rise to these collections coming into museums. And that we found if one does that calmly, tactfully, openly and honestly, uh, uh, in a lot of the museums I've worked in, we found that um, it's a really good opportunity for museums as contact zones for these objects, whether they're anatomical or anthropological or archaeological, to be used as boundary objects between different communities and to promote understanding. But it's a very difficult thing to do. And it, uh, for many people, it's about taking them outside of their comfort zone, whether they're audiences or visitors or whether they're curators or um, museum public program professionals. It's a very difficult thing to do, but it's another excellent question. Do you have some questions in the chat, Anne-Marie, that you wanted to yeah. ask? Yes, there are some. Um, how can we situate medical museums with their changing functions within the history of museums in general? Were they following new trends or maybe setting trends? And how is it now? So I think uh, medical museums um, weren't as separate as perhaps, you know, it might seem from my account here when I was kind of distilling them out. We need to remember that often these collections are part of much broader, um, of a much broader museum landscape. And often when they're, especially if they're in a university, for example, the medical collection will be one of a range of, of, um, of museums. And the two examples there, so if we take the University of Edinburgh, for example, the anatomical museum was in one part of the original university quadrangle, but the other museums, the, uh, the archaeological, the zoological were in other parts. So, okay, so they had separate curators and classes and so on, but they were part of um, a museum ecosystem within an organization and then within the broader university sphere um, beyond it. And then again, we see that sort of coming back into play with the way universities are using their medical museums alongside others as well. As to whether they're sort of um, cutting edge um, or not, it depends on the sort of practice we're talking about. So medical museums, because of the nature, especially anatomical museums, because of the nature of the material in them, were actually to some degree, relatively swift in responding from the 1990s onwards, relatively swift in responding to um, requests for repatriation of human remains from, from non-European sources, for example, in the UK. There's certainly the work um, I was privileged to be involved with around disability. I think they were that um, in talking to the museologists we work with, medical that, that particular I mean, it's a small example, but that particular group were, were I, I like to think, fairly innovative. But in other ways, because they're relatively small and rather specialist, in other ways, they perhaps haven't been on the cutting edge of um, audience engagement, or they've been, tend to be rather smaller, certainly in the UK. Um, <clears throat> But of course, the Welcome, Welcome Collection is, has been pretty innovative in a whole bunch of stuff. But actually, Welcome Collection almost disowns 
its own um, this is welcome collection as opposed to the welcome material at the science museum which is confusing a welcome collection rebranded itself when it reopened in 2007 as a not as a medical museum but as a destination for the incurably curious and you couldn't really see its connection to its medical museum past so um that's a long answer to a question of is in some respects medical museums have been innovative in others they maybe lagged a little bit behind but for the most part they tend to be part of broader institutions organizations in any case so they're they're necessarily part of of the, the wider museum movements over the past couple of centuries but thank you another excellent question um okay i have another one so here, here's a question, should, and the answer is yes, how should museums broaden their definitions of medical knowledge to expand beyond classical Western medicine's ways of knowing? Uh, uh, yes, of course, is the answer. And that's a really good and very topical question. So um, there's a very interesting case study of one museum whose stakeholders, whose senior stakeholders did not consider Western medicine to be part of the history of medicine or did not want it presented. This was a little while ago, I should say, in a museum that I, that <laughs> given we're being recorded, won't mention, given especially now that that museum has recovered from this um, misconception. Um, the challenge is that a lot of the medical museums, the core collections that we have inherited, have been gathered from, you know, gathered by white European men about white European men. And that's a problem to overcome. It can be overcome. Perhaps the surprising exception to that rule was um, Henry Welcome, who gathered just in such vast quantities and was fascinated by juxtapositions and contrast between different cultures, that actually the Welcome collection is incredibly rich in both European and non-European uh, medical traditions. And that's something we can all aspire to. But that's a very good question. Thank you. Okay, there's, I think we have time for one more. And uh, it's, are any science museums or medical museums using genetics in education about disabilities, racism, et cetera? Um, we're using genetics, but not in those areas just yet. I think the time is ripe to look at that. Two challenges. One, as in many things, incredibly difficult um, uh, area to, 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 to grasp and to understand and to not to bring with it um, possibly damaging misconceptions. And secondly, um, because for the most part in museums, you want to evidence your stories, you want to tell your stories with material culture. And that connection would be challenging, is challenging to materialize in material culture. Um, you know, not least because genetics, like many sciences, you know, as the um, as the um, uh, as the the science develops and advances, things become faster and cheaper and smaller and kind of less impressive to look at. But that's something we have to deal with all the time. So that's a real. I think the potential there is very strong. Okay. Should we ask one more? I uh, I have one. Uh... Go One ahead. from the chat, if you don't mind, since, since Dr. Eidelman is, is with us, the Dean of the Faculty, should medical history be mandatory in medical school? <laughs> I, I would point I, out that I'm not the speaker. <laughs> I, I will answer for the Dean and say categorically yes. <laughs> or as far as possible, I think it benefits medical history, medical museology, uh, under the banner of medical humanities, I think can greatly benefit and enhance a, um, a medical curriculum. And I've worked with medical curriculums, curricula uh, for, that, for that purpose. And, um, you know, there's evidence that it does benefit 
um, medical back back into benefit medical training. But then again, that evidence is often gathered by medical humanists. So you might want to take a little chat there. But um, it's not surprising that I would say yes, I think. We, we do just for the record have uh, lectures in medical history. We do not have uh, maybe as much as some people would like, but the, the Department of Social Studies of Medicine is part of the School of Medicine in our faculty. And so we are committed to humanities and medicine. Yeah, so perhaps on that high SSOM note, we should um, call it an evening for you. We appreciate how late you've stayed up to be with us. It's a fantastic lecture. You've really inspired us. And uh, thanks to everybody for coming tonight.